All right, so I know that the participants are being admitted in. Hello, everyone. We're now live on Facebook, just so that everyone is aware. <laughs> um, so we'll just wait for a bit, for a bit, for more of the participants to join in before we get the ball rolling. Okay. Okie dokes, while we're waiting, I actually want to point out, Azim, I quite like your background. It's very patriotic. <laughs> Thank you. I make sure I iron my flag before. <laughs> like you're prepared. <laughs> actually, Prof James, uh, are you dialing from Malaysia or are you dialing from elsewhere? If I may ask. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm actually uh, based in Tasmania. Oh, I so I'm see. two hours ahead of you. I get you, I get you. I see. Oh. Thank you for making the time. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right, so maybe if we're okay, we'll start in about two more minutes, eight, five. If that's okay with everyone. Great. Yeah. While we're waiting, why don't you tell uh, the audience something about your organization, the Dewa Muda? Oh, that'd be great. Okay. I think just to give a little bit. So Dewa Muda Malaysia right now, um, maybe just a little bit on why we decided to conduct this particular webinar in light of Sarawak Day, which is happening really soon because it's already the 20th and then um, Sarawak Day is on the 22nd of July. So the reason why Dewan Muda Malaysia Sarawak, which consists of about 31 representatives. Okay, it's recorded. Um, the reason why we're going to do this is because we want to further shed light on the significance of the 22nd of July, 1963, because we believe that both not just non-Sarawakians, but Sarawakians may not really understand the importance of it yet. And that's why we have our panelists here, who I will be introducing a little bit later. Um, but then let's look forward. And actually, we can start now if all the panelists are ready, because it's already 8.5. Maybe we could get a thumbs up if everyone's all right. Okay, I see thumbs up. All right. So hello, everyone, to the panelists, to, the, to those who have entered, the participants. My name is Adila, but I go by Del because it's easier that way. And I'll be moderating today's webinar, as you know, which is titled as the 22nd of July, Different Insights on Sarawak Day. Um, just to reiterate, the reason why we're doing this is so that we could shed further light on the significance of this particular day and hopefully spread more awareness on the scene. Now, before we begin, just allow me to remind you of a few housekeeping rules because it's online, things can happen. So please remain muted for the participants throughout the session unless you are requested to unmute. And later, if you'd like to pose a question, you may either, number one, you can raise your hand, there's a raise your hand icon, and ask a question when I prompt you to. Or if you are not comfortable with um, speaking, or if you would rather type up your questions, you can do so in the chat box. Um, but you're highly encouraged to speak instead so that it's a bit more engage, um, engaging, okay? And for those who are tuning in on Facebook, you can drop your questions in the comment section. Don't worry, we will get to them. I will have a secretariat to, um, to 
highlight your questions to me and we'll be covering them during the Q&A session later. Just to brief as well, everyone, how this session will go, we will start off with some panel questions. And maybe at around 9, 9.5ish, after one hour, we'll start taking in questions from the floor, from all of you. <laughs> so that'll be more fun. And that is the flow for today. Now, I know most of you are probably familiar with our pan panelists today, but I'm going to introduce them nevertheless. Firstly, we have Professor James Chin, who is a professor of Asian studies from the University of Tasmania. He's the leading commentator on Malaysian politics and published extensively on Malaysia and its surrounding region, widely regarded as the leading scholar of contemporary Sabah and Sarawak. His commentaries and views are carried by the world's leading media, such as CNBC, The New York Times, and Financial Times. That's Professor James Chin. So next, we also have Ms. Lina Su today, who is the current leader of an opposition party in Sarawak, the Party Aspirasi Rakyat Sarawak. And her aim is to fight for what's right, for Sarawak and Sarawak rights. She's released two books. So the first book is given the title Sarawak, The Real Deal, where she wrote the book after she avidly goes through the um, declassified colonial documents passed to her by a Sarawak-born Aussie legal petitioner. Her second book, released in 2016, and her words provides comprehensive documentation of the chronological history of Sarawak based on constitutional documents and letters assessed from the British National Archives in London. So that's Miss Lina Su. Thirdly, uh, we are aware we were supposed to have Yang Muhammad Datuk Sri Wan Junaidi, the minister in the Prime Minister Department, Law and Parliament. However, he's unable to make it tonight due to official engagements. But nevertheless, don't worry. We have a youth on board tonight <laughs> who will also enlighten us with his view. He's no other than Mr. Azim Rahman or Azim, as he's requested me to <laughs> refer to him to the rest of the, the session. He is the youngest exco of the youth of Pesat Bumi Putra P um, Bersatu, PBB, 26, graduated with a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Reading, also a legal officer in a local energy company in the corporate world. His experience as a youth activist in his varsity days broadened his paradigm towards marking his footprint in politics young. Overall, he believes that providing young generation with opportunities to engage in the policy making process is the key to upholding our country's democratic ideal of self determination. Because the youth needs to be more visible and there needs to be representation at every level to create a more sustainable, inclusive, and socially efficient society. So, that is the introduction for our line of speakers today. So, let's get this party started <laughs> with the first question for today, which reads as this Right now, there are two different views on the 22nd of July. One side saying that is the date where Sarawak gained its independence. But another side is claiming that it's merely a date where Sarawak was granted self-governance. I will be, um, this is directed to all of the speakers, but maybe if we could, would Ms. Nasu go like, would she like to go first? Because I'm sure you would like to project a document as well later. Okay. You have the floor. Good evening, Puan Moderator, Professor James Chin, Yang Berbahagia, Azim Rahman, members of Dewan Muda Sarawak team, and all viewers turning in. First, I want to congratulate Muda Sarawak for putting together this program and the opportunity for me to speak. Well done. Without further ado, I'd like to answer the first question. And may I call up one document? Can I call up this document to screen share? Okay. All right. Um, in a moment, you're on it. Okay. Is this the document? Okay. Okay. First, I need to define what is independence and what is self governance. Okay. English is a very ambiguous language. A word can have many meanings depending on usage, context, and time. I actually found a UN document which lists the factors indicative of the attainment of independence. So if you look at this document, factors indicative of the attainment of independence. There are two parts to it, A and B. A is international status, B is interne internal self-government. Okay. So which means there are two levels of independence. Okay. The first level, which is International status, okay. list down the factors. Number one, international responsibility. Full international responsibility of the territory for the acts inherent in the exercise of its external sovereignty. 
and for the corresponding acts in the administration of its internal affairs. Two, eligibility for membership to UN. Three, general international relations, power to enter into direct relations of every kind with other governments and, uh, and with international institutions and to negotiate, sign and ratify international instruments. Four, national defense. Sovereign rights to provide for is national defense. The other level is B, internal self-government. Okay. So this is a criteria. One form of government, complete freedom of the people of the territory to choose the form of government which they desire. Two, territorial government, freedom from control or interference by the government of another state in respect of the in internal government, legislative, executive, judiciary, and administration of the territory. Three, economic, social, and cultural jurisdiction, complete autonomy in respect of economic, social, and cultural affairs. Okay. So as you can read from this document, there are two levels. Okay. So under internal self-government, okay, we have a form of government, territorial government, and economic, social, and cultural jurisdiction. So if you look at Sarawak, we have internal self-government. So this is also under the UN criteria. This is also independence. Okay. So an independent nation is broadly defined as a defined territory, a permanent population, a government, a system of tax and law. Any territory which fulfills these four criteria is an independent nation. So to achieve independence of international status, there is a process to go through. It's never given of right. Okay, there's a political process. Do other states recognize your independence? The legal and diplomatic. Do other nations agree to your state to set up an embassy in their country? And there's UN recognition to become a member. Okay. So if you can see, we, we fulfill B. Okay, we are a defined territory with a history, with a language, a permanent population, we have a government, we have a system of tax and law. So we are an independent nation, but we have not reached the next level of international status. So I dare to say that 22nd July is a day of independence of Sarawak because it fulfills all the four criteria with a fully functioning, functioning local government with a chief minister and cabinet. Our new Sarawak government, which was instit instituted on, uh, on 22nd July 1963, could actually sack the British governor who could remain until Malaysia there. But Sarawak independence had not achieved international status because 20 days later, Sarawak merged with Malaya to form a component state of the Federation of Malaysia. So this is my uh, reasoning. Okay, this is my argument. Yes, Sarawak is an independent nation without full sovereignty, okay, without uh, the level of international status. But we are an independent nation because we fulfill the criteria for the first level. The other thing is, if you look at this, the Sarawak government gazette. The public, uh, the public holiday, Sarawak Independence Day. Okay. This is the government gazette, volume 71st, number 38, on 26 of May 2016. And it says the citation, the notification may be cited as a public holiday, Sarawak Independence Day notification 2016. 22nd day of July in every year to be observed as public holiday. Okay. So the 22nd day of July in every year commencing from the year 2016 has been appointed to be observed as a public holiday in Sarawak to be known as Sarawak Independence Day in addition to the days mentioned in the first schedule to the ordinance. So I want to say, you know, when the government published in the Sarawak Gazette, no, in the Sarawak Amana, 
22nd July is Israel Independence Day. I'd like to correct them. We cannot change you know, the wording of our gazetted notification at will, you know, at whim and fancy. We, we don't like the word independence, so we don't like the word independence. So this is my argument. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lina. So basically, your argument when it comes to that public holiday is that to keep Independence Day inside as it has been gazetted in the public holiday ordinance. Is that correct? Yes, we must. We have to follow the law. Yes. When you're not, when you're not following the law, you're breaching the gazette, you're breaching, you know, throughout legislation. You're breaking the law. <laughs> Maybe just a follow up before I will pass it on to Prof. Um, James next is why do you think they decided to remove it? Well, why decide to disregard it entirely? Oh, Miss Lina? Oh, sorry? The, uh, yeah, a follow-up was like, why do you think that they decide to exclude it from the Gazette? No? I think the GPS government is instilling this fear in the right yeah. Hmm. So somehow they are trying to brainwash, <laughs> brainwash mm -hmm. us, you know, to get the word independence out of our head. So the word independence becomes the big elephant in the room. We are not supposed to, uh, you know, talk about it to the extent that we cannot even, you know. Uh, call 22nd July as Israel Independence Day anymore. I think the Israel government deserves to give us an explanation. Quite interesting. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lina. It's almost like it's like they're trying to forget it. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lina. Actually, we're going to go over that in the next question as well. But before that, we'll just continue on with this first question because we have to listen from our other two speakers. Maybe Prof. James you can continue on with your view. Sorry, can I ask Azim to answer first? I'll be the last. <laughs> All right, well, I can, can. Azim, go ahead. You have the floor. I'm to hear the experts first. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I just uh, thank you, Adila. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Lina and Professor James. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Dewan Muda Malaysia uh, for having uh, me uh, here as well uh, with uh, two prominent leaders of, uh, of, Sarawak, of, of Sarawak, which I've been following them since uh, I was a young age. Now it's an honor for myself and us youth to be in the same room, technically virtually, uh, with uh, these two uh, prominent figures. So personally, Adila um, uh, and our respected panelists, um, I believe that this question is um, highly debatable. Uh, for some, for some leaders, uh, they they see that this topic is very sensitive. However, I believe that the the younger generation of my party uh, believe and uh, um, uh, believes in civil discussions, and even though it's been made public, but it can be done in a very civil, uh, respectful manner. This uh, this kind of uh, discourses and debate, and uh, which which I commend uh, the one Muda Malaysia Sarawak uh, to have this kind of discussion uh, with uh, the right people to discuss. And however, for me. Uh, my opinion on this uh, limited to myself as a uh, as a, a legal practitioner, not a historian. So I can't. Uh, I'm not in the authority to confirm to neither invalidate whether it is uh, an independence day or merely just a day which we achieve uh, self governance. Though uh, by fact, uh, they are source, sources strongly uh, indicate that Sarawak did achieve. Um, part of the factors which we uh, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, factors which uh, uh, which amounts to independence so one of it is having our own self governance there's no doubt about that which we which we had our own uh, Sarawakian uh, leaders to become the leader of the government uh, back then however it is highly debatable whether we had uh, full sovereignty over our territory because um, um, that one I leave it to the historians to to uh, to, to to debate because uh, but however which I would like to highlight here that uh, by law, uh, uh, de jure that uh, uh, the twenty sixteen gazettement uh, the the twenty sixteen gazettement is that twenty second July nineteen sixty three is an Independence Day, 
So I think, however, um, uh, myself, which I believe in uh, um, uh, having civil discussions like this, uh, it's a gazettement which has been, uh, which was approved in the Dune. Um, ordinances, uh, ordinances can be amended, gazettes can be amended, and even, uh, even constitution, uh, constitution articles can also be amended if facts of, uh, if facts indicate that this, uh, so facts and resources indicate that this date is an independent. I think we can, we should, uh, the, what, what has been brought up into, uh, in 2016, uh, should, uh, should continue be Independence Day. And of course, an extra holiday for us. And if it's, if it's otherwise, I think, it, it, uh, I think uh, this loss can be uh, still still amended can can be uh, amended in our own doing and debatable. Thank you, Rila. Thank you, Azim. Like as you mentioned, that like, it can be amended. So who should be the ones you know pushing for that, showing that okay, it should be amended. There is sources. You know? Personally, for me, if uh, this uh, different opinion, uh, different opinions of. Uh, of views that if if whether whether the hypothetically whether if this was not an independent state, uh, um, uh, people, uh, I, I think historians and also people who are who are representing us in the assembly uh, should should bring should, can they, they they can bring this up and and uh, bring it about that if it is not an independence and it should be otherwise. I think that is the legal way of how we. Uh, if they if they believe that it's not independent, it's not independent day. I think that's the way uh, they should do it. And would you believe? Would you think that this is something that should be answered? Uh, personally, for me, uh, personally for me, uh, I'm I'm pro for for uh, extra holidays. <laughs> uh, I believe uh, I I appreciate both both views, but uh, however myself, I. I celebrate this date as something very significant that my forefathers fought for our independence, the democracy that I, I, I exercise right now. I think that's more important for me. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, Azim. Thank you. And I would agree, sensitive topics can be discussed in a civil manner. It's just how a matter of how someone goes about it. All right. So we've heard from Ms. Lina and Azim. Prof. James, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to start off by thanking Dewan Muda Sarab for the kind invitation to appear in this webinar. Uh, with Lina, an old friend of mine, and of course, uh, Azim, which is the new generation of Sorokins. Okay, now to answer this question, it really uh, comes down. I think the best way to look at it is that you look at a contemporary example. The contemporary example, uh, uh, and this is consistent with uh, what Lina said, is that you have a case of Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, for all uh, uh, intent and purposes, they have a, a government, they have an army, they have their own air links, they have their own flag. Uh, but at the international level, there's only about eight or nine countries that recognizes them. And they do not have a seat uh, at the United Nations and they only have a seat or a partial seat in some other international organizations. So it really comes down to uh, at the individual level, uh, uh, whether you believe that Taiwan is independent or you think that Taiwan uh, is semi-independent or you feel that you know eventually Taiwan will be uh, part of uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, but having said that, I think it's also very important to look at it within the historical context. Uh, it is quite clear that the reasons why we have all these sort of questions being asked today in the year 2022 is because the era of colonization in Southeast Asia was a very messy affair. Uh, it's a messy affair in the sense that uh, when uh, the Federation of Malaysia was formed, when the Federation of Malaya was formed, when Europeans power got out of this region, there were basically two routes. Uh, the first one was that uh, there are some countries in the region that fought for independence and therefore the date of independence is much clearer. But there's another set of countries in the region that sort of negotiated their way out of independence. And that is the route that was basically taken by the Federation of Malaya and uh, Sabah, oh, sorry, North Borneo and Sarawak. Now, of course, you can go back and look at all the documents and make uh, arguments, uh, you know, saying that what is the motive of the British. And of course, you can also make the argument that within the Cold War context of the 1960s, right, uh, none of the countries in this region were truly independent. In other words, uh, they were still caught up in the Cold War complex and they were influenced by the big powers. 
So it really, at the end of the day, uh, I think much more important is uh, you have to recognize that uh, the 22nd of July, that is highly symbolic. That, because that was the first time uh, the people of Sarawak, at least for the ordinary people in Sarawak, uh, they saw for the very first time that a local born Sarawakian was the top political dog, the number one guy. It was no longer the governor. I think for, for me, uh, that was highly, highly symbolic. Uh, in terms of if you really want to argue, I would uh, probably suggest that if you go around the world and pick the best, uh, uh, you know, do a straw poll among international lawyers, uh, most of them will probably answer similar to mine, which is that, you know, uh, in terms of the two criteria laid out by uh, Ms. Lina just now, that in terms of international recognition, uh, it's none back in the 1960s, uh, but there was a high level of internal government. But even that, uh, it was debatable because you can always find another historian to step out and say that uh, it is not really internal government because all the key positions in the civil service were actually held by uh, British nationals. So again, you know, it depends on what you mean by, by independence. So my, my take on this situation is that uh, uh, you can argue, uh, you know, until the cows come home, you're not going to get an answer because colonization, the very fact of colonization is a very messy affair. For me, the 22nd date is, 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 is highly symbolic. It's really important for the people of Sarawak because for the very first time, people clearly understood that a local person was in charge. Uh, but we also know that that person who was uh, uh, in charge uh, eventually knew that uh, Sarawak was on its way to joining a, a larger federation or helping to form a larger federation. Thank you so much, Professor James, for that. Um, actually, because since we're talking a lot about the 22nd of July, the second question is also about that gazettement particularly. So maybe I could also um, just pose the same question that I posed to Azim just now, to Prof. James and Ms. Lena Su. Do you think that this is a question that needs to be answered or do you think it's just something that, oh, you know, it's on the side? My, my impression is that when people ask about why is there a change in wording in the gazettement, why is there a change in this, why is there a change in that, right? Um, People always believe in, uh, when it comes to uh, Malaysia, especially Sarawak, people always believe that there's a conspiracy. Somebody decided all these things. Uh, having studied uh, Malaysian government process for a very, very long time, I can't tell you how many years because it'll reveal my age. So, <laughs> the reality is that our government is not as competent as you think. <laughs> The person who did the annual revisions for the Gazette, all that sort of thing, probably did not look carefully at the earlier Gazette and look at the earlier wordings. So uh, you'll be surprised that a lot of government documents, there are a lot of messiness, a lot of mistakes made. So if there's one or two words missing on this issue, uh, I would suggest that uh, it's probably uh, not due to any, uh, 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 what they call it, uh, political order. I think it's due to some bureaucrat uh, what I might call or what we might say playing it safe uh, you know taking out certain words because they, they think that this is going to get them in trouble uh, that would rather be the case than, than uh, actual somebody giving order that you should not use this word that, I mean that's my take okay, thank you so much Professor James for that what about Miss Lina to continue on with that follow up question as well right. as I said this document this is a UN doc uh, document which supports my contention that Sarawak attained independent status on 22nd July because there's a defined territory, there's a permanent population, there's a government, and there's a system of uh, tax and law. Okay. Uh, so therefore, the word Sarawak Independence Day should not be changed. Okay. Adun are not international law experts. What we need to do is, maybe we need to refer this document to public international law experts and get their opinion, their legal opinion, which has been, which had been done before in the 1940s, you know, whether you're independent or sovereign. Yeah. So we must, we have to maintain the sort of independence there because we achieve independence, but not at international level, but uh, self-government level. Okay. This is my contention. Someone suggested, you know, as reported in uh, uh, in Diet Daily, he said, oh, somebody prepared the document and Adinan signed it. Okay. That is not true. Okay. 
Adinan does not sign Bupa. He's a learned scholar, okay? And he does not sign what they do not read. Lawyers do not sign without reading the fine print, you know, cross the T's and the I's. He knew what he was doing. What more to say, the Chief Minister of Sarawak, who is a learned scholar. Okay. So like I say, this issue, whether Sarawak is independent on 22nd July, under international law, under customary law, this can only be answered by international law experts, not by Adun or even by a GPS government. So perhaps our government would get a legal opinion and clarify whether you know, the word independence applies to Strawak or not. This is the only way. I will not accept just, you know, the uh, government just simply say that, oh, you know, the Gaza it, we cannot use the word independence anymore. That's, that's not uh, doable. Mm, I understand. I mean, basically, it's a question that requires an answer, but it has to be a substantiated answer. It can't just simply be like, oh, it's because of this, but without any... Even the adult cannot answer. <laughs> Even some lawyers cannot answer because they are not well versed in international law. Okay. So I had I asked this question over and over. I talk endlessly, endlessly, endlessly with, you know, with a, a lawyer mm. who has a master's in public international law. And this is the same thing. He's telling me the same thing that this document affirm that if a nation, you know, a defined territory or population has its government and makes its own laws, it's an, it's an independent nation. But to the next level, to get international status, then you have to get other nations to recognize you or a superpower to recognize you. So this is my contention, and I don't believe you know, our Dun can settle this matter. Hey, thank you, Ms. My, my eyebrows are like this because I'm trying to get in every, everyone's <laughs> opinion. I'm trying to digest it as well. I'm trying to see things at different light. I hope the participants who are on, online right now, you're feeling the same thing as I, as I am. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much, Ms. Lina. Azim, is there anything you'd like to add to this? No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Let's go. Yeah. It's quite it's, it's interesting to see how we are progressing with this. All right, so the next question is okay, now that we have the dates, this 22nd of July in front of us right now, what significance does it have to view this date from different perspective? Would it be any different if someone was to view it as Sarawak Independence Day or just a self governance day? Maybe I could start off with if Azim, you're okay. <laughs> we can start off with you first. Yes, Ken. Um, for me, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, Adila, but, uh, for me, that celebrating an Independence Day or Sarawak Day or even National Day, for me, it is a celebration um, of the people, of the people who, uh, who are the, ben who are the bene beneficiaries of the independence, beneficiaries of the freedom and, uh, and the rights, the democratic rights that they, that we practice today. It's not merely a government function or for somebody to achieve KPI to celebrate uh, uh, Sarawak Day or, or Independence Day. And for me, it's uh, what is significant, what is significant for me uh, here is that it should be celebrated by the people in what I concur with what uh, uh, Professor James mentioned earlier, it's about how the people see it. I, I, right now, I see that uh, I see that many Sarawakians appreciate that this date was a very significant date that um, our forefathers who, who are able to come together and form, and form a government and, and finally lead our own, our own nation, which is, uh, which is uh, part of a history which uh, personally I am and many other Sarawakians are many other Sarawakians are really proud of. So for me, I, I do not uh, the question is whether right now is uh, whether our our own Sarawakians will they appreciate our uh, appreciate our forefathers uh, our forefathers uh, what, what they brought for our country and do we appreciate 
uh, the democracy, democratic rights that we practice. Do, do young people go out and vote? So I think uh, that's a bigger question, which I uh, I always emphasize and always I always emphasize when I do engagements with uh, young youngsters uh, youngsters within within my area. So for me, if you were if, if it were to change, but if if it was to change from Sarawak Independence Day to maybe just uh, Sarawak Day by itself. For me, what is important is the content that whether our own, so again, especially the younger generation, right now the challenge is whether no, they, they don't really understand it. Uh, they don't really fully understand this, how how uh, how our history was. Do they, uh, are they inheriting the love that uh, the leaders, uh, uh, do, are they inheriting the uh, what is meant, uh, what Tok Nan wanted uh, to happen in 2016 to celebrate uh, to celebrate the love that our forefathers uh, gave us, which is the democratic rights and the freedom, which we uh, inherit freely until today. So yeah, that's my message. Hey, thank you, Azim. And honestly, that's it's good that you highlight these things to the youth when in your engagements. Because honestly, for me, I only started really understanding it a bit more when I was past twenty. I'm um the high school lah pun waktu ya, but it's kind of a bit too late, yeah, <laughs> for that to happen. So it's better if people like you and maybe everyone else as well, the younger, and just making them trying to understand. And this coming from your youth juga. And it's kind of sad, you know, in the sense that yeah, if I, you if want I to try understand. Lah, for, mm -hmm. for us, for us, Leonard, mm -hmm. I would say lah, youths who are, who are with privilege that we are, we have the privilege of education. We have the privilege of myself sitting with prominent figures today. It's our responsibility for us to share this, the right message to the to, to the right, the right message to our our other friends who are who are beyond our circle. So it's uh, at the end of the day, it's our generation who will be uh, who will be leading this leading this nation at one day. So I think it's very important for us to have a to become a generation who who knows history, who knows constitution at least. For me, um, uh, for me, I mean, I think our generation later on, if 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 I were to lead, I need to make sure that all of them understand. Our constitution, our stand, our understand the Malaysian Agreement, nineteen sixty three. I think that that is the prerequisite, and I think for me, it's general knowledge for all young who youngsters who that's the prerequisite for them if they were they aspire to be part of politics. That's my aspiration for my generation. I have to agree with that I will support you entirely, and thank you to DMM Sarawak as well because it's because of youth like you guys who really help you know, reach out to the other youth as well when it comes to these type of platforms. So thank you, Azim. Now we move on to Professor James. What do you think? What's your view on this? So I think uh, July 22nd is extremely important in today's context because it really is uh, shining a light on a very important date. And what I especially think is important is that it encourages uh, young Sarakians and not only Sarakians because it's widely reported throughout the Federation that people start to learn about uh, July 22nd. I think one of the problems we have in Malaysia is that uh, Malaysia history, the hi people's history of Malaysia, right, is too Malaya-centric. And there's not enough uh, history about what really happened to North Borneo and Sarawak. So if we can shine a light on 22nd of July, we get younger Sarawakians to learn more about what 22nd of July means. I think all those are very good things. I think it's also very important not only to get them interested, but really it's a process of educating a whole new generation of young people about the real history, uh, not only of the Federation, but really the process of decolonization and how Sarawak came to be Sarawak today. Uh, I think very often, uh, how should I put this? Uh, very often the uh, the sejarah that is being taught in Malaysian schools, not only is it very, uh, being very Malaya centric, uh, the problem is that uh, they represents a, a view that is often uh, uh, how say, marginalized a lot of uh, groups. There are lots of silent voices in, 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 in Malaysia. And uh, Sarawak is one of the three uh, key components of the new federation of Malaysia, mm -hmm. 63. Uh, basically, uh, uh, history owes younger Sarawakians at least one third of the story should be about Sarawak. So for me, the 22nd of July is really a learning moment. And one of the reasons why this can only happen in, 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 you know, in 2022 or after 2008 uh, is because of, of the, uh, you know, 
because of the technological age that we live in there where we have things like social media uh, this sort of thing would not happen say in the early 1990s uh, you know even in those days uh, there was only one narrative so i'm a believer that uh, you know all voices should be heard and on something as important as 22nd of january i think it's uh, crucial that the younger sarakians uh, uh, understand what it stands for and perhaps uh, learning more about Sarah, it also reinforces which I consider to be the core issue, which is the issue of Sarawak identity. Because I think if you look at it for the past uh, 50 years, uh, the identity of Sabahans and Sarawakians has been consumed by the national identity, which is basically, as I said earlier, very Malaya centric. Uh, if you go over to, to Peninsula Malaysia, you hear the same complaint from the Kelantanis and Johorians. But I like, the people of uh, Sabah and Sarawak, they don't have their, uh, you know, a very unique history like what we have. I mean, the reality is that the more you learn about 22nd of, of, of July, uh, you'll find that, you know, the story of Sarawak is truly unique. The story of North Borneo is truly unique. Uh, the story of, of Malaya is, is, I'm not saying it's not unique, but I'm just saying they don't have as many unique touch points as we do in North Borneo and, and Sarawak. So I think it's really worth learning uh, in today's age, I think it's very important that we know who we are. And I think the issue of identity is coming back in a big way. So 22nd of July for me is really a learning moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, and I, I, oh, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I concur with uh, Professor James. And I do believe that, uh, I do believe that uh, Sarawak is seriously underrepresented in, in at national level. I think that's a I think that's a loss for uh, for Sarawak. Though we were equal partners when we, when we formed when we formed Malaysia, we were equal partners. But uh, right now, uh, our national curriculum. Um, if we do not talk about rentap on textbooks, I don't think my generation would know about rentap. If we don't talk about Rosido B on textbooks, they they wouldn't know. So, uh, patah lagi uh, very important and significant history in regards to this Sarawak day. If we if it if we do not preach it uh, like how socially uh, when we talk socially with to, to my own friends to intellectual discourses like this through uh, events that is organized by youth-led uh, organizations i think it would be a loss for us uh, if 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 we just uh, uh, if we just depend if we are very dependent on on how the status quo uh, is nationally i think it's a loss for us as as uh, basically we 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 have always been underrepresented underrepresented nationally. I would agree to that. I go to both uh, what Azim and Professor James have said. The fact that history is so Malaya centric, even if you go to Museum Negara, for instance, it's still Malaya centric, and that's supposed to be Museum Negara, as you can see. Um, but at the same time, I would also agree because you need to know yourself in order to appreciate even more. But the problem I notice is that it's so hard to find sources. There might be people who want to know more, but it's like it's nowhere. It's like it's disappeared. Why do you think that this is so? Why is it as though history has been erased for a reason? Or is it just because it's never been documented? Uh, can I say something about this? Uh, I, yeah, I will sure. disagree with you. If, if, if you go to a Google search, right, there are, in fact, millions of documents dealing, dealing with Sarawak dealing with Sarawak history. Uh, the problem is that we are living at an age where we are overloaded with information. So people tend to search for something very simple. So that's the reason why things like TikTok are very popular. <laughs> because whatever you want to say, you got to stick it in, I think, within two or three minutes. Otherwise, it doesn't work, right? So people want to distill everything into what we call the case principle. Keep it simple and stupid. I mean, that's the idea behind Twitter as well, right? Which is that you have a limited number of words. Uh, there's no way, if, if you don't get your, your message out in the first, uh, what, 300 characters, uh, people are just going to scroll and move on to the, to, the, to the next one. So I think there are lots of information out there. Uh, what is lacking is really uh, what I might call uh, um, uh, high quality information. Uh, and also the problem with this is that uh, Sorokians like the rest of Malaysia, uh, we are not really a, a, a reading public. Uh, the most... Uh, people read is really uh, the local newspapers and newspapers by their very definition anything serious or lengthy they have to push it to Saturday and Sunday editions uh, you know so uh, we really need to uh, uh, come up with a narrative about what Sarah is about 
and uh, we have to support young people who want to produce items about Sarawak. So that's how you build up history about place. So, uh, you know, you need people to produce videos, documentaries, write books, books for children, all that sort of thing. So we need that sort of an ecosystem where uh, people write about uh, Sarawak. And we, we haven't reached that stage yet. So I'm hoping that, you know, with more and more young people uh, learning about 22nd July, uh, learning about their own history, I uh, you know that more and more young people will come out. Um, in the last few years, uh, I've been in a privileged position where people uh, you know, want to do documentaries. Uh, they come and talk to me because I'm sort of the Sarawak expert. So I've come across a lot of young people who really want to produce a lot of really, really interesting stuff. And uh, 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 the big issue they always face is you know, they're bombarded by so much materials. They don't know which approach to take. Uh, the second issue is, of course, funding. So if there's something that will come good out of this uh, this year's 22nd of July celebration, I'm really hoping that the Sarawak Multimedia uh, Authority or maybe even the Sarawak government itself through the Sarawak Library and the Yayasan Sarawak Foundation, maybe they should really, you know, uh, it's actually quite simple. You give small grants to people who want to tell Sarawak stories. Uh, I mean, for the longest time, the only Sarawak stories I'm talking about before 2008, for the longest time from 63 up to 2008, the only stories told about Sarawak has always been ethnographic, you know, about the Ibans, about the Melanaos, you know, all this <laughs> very uh, uh, simple tale about living in a long house and all that sort of uh, different ethnic groups. But I think we reached a stage where we have enough of that material already. We need to uh, move on to the next stage, which is really the essence of the question I asked earlier. Uh, what is Sarawak? What is unique about Sarawak? Mm -hmm. And I think this is something uh, to GPS credit, they understood very clearly. Uh, this thick idea is actually not a new idea, but uh, it wasn't widely known in Sarawak, as I mentioned, because we were not living at, we were living at a different age. Uh, those of you uh, like my age who remember what the 70s and late 60s were about, they will have remembered that uh, in those days, uh, the main party was not PBB. In those days, the big name was Sarawak National Party, SNAP. And SNAP's original uh, slogan was actually Sarawak for the Sarawakians. <laughs> so it is, it is not something new. A lot of stuff that we see today, right? I'm not saying it's recycled, but I'm saying that it's occurred before in history. But uh, we are living at a different stage of history. And uh, I think this is the right time to really launch into this ecosystem where we really need to ourselves, the people of Sarawak has to produce and define what being Sarawak is. And I think that's really important because otherwise in 10 or 20 years time, uh, once you lose your identity, it's very difficult to get it back. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. James. It's basically making things more accessible, digestible, and hopefully that those people who do have these initiatives get the support that they need. Right. Is there anything that maybe Ms. Lina or Isaac would like to add on to that before we go on to the next question? Ms. Lina? Yes, uh, back to the question. Would it change anything if we were to build the dead 22nd of July as South Independence Day or just self-governance day? There's no nation in the world that celebrates self-governance day. Okay, not to my knowledge, every nation celebrates Independence Day. To censor the word independence from official gazetted notification is weird. I want to question the GPS government, why are they instilling fear in the rakyat to create a state of distress and terror in the hearts and minds of people when it comes to the word independence by modifying Sarawak Independence Day into Sarawak Day. Whether used correctly or in or incorrectly, the word independence should never be made to become the big elephant in the room. Okay. So this is what I want to say. I stress again, okay. Adinan was not wrong when he gazetted it. He signed it into law as Sarawak Independence Day. And I urge the Sarawak government, okay, please get a legal opinion from two international law experts. They will do it for you for a fee. Then we can get our answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lina. Azim, is there anything you wanted to add on to that first? Yeah, I, I understand uh, the, uh, the issue being brought by Professor James when he mentioned that um, 
there a lot of information. Right now, our generation, compared to their generation, we can find information at the end of our fingertips. We can just Google then there, there that information is. However, uh, it is important for us, I, I remind uh, my fellow youth friends that yeah, if we get information, we get the right information, not false information. And when we uh, and, and we have to find, uh, we have to be creative in how we want to uh, educate the public. Uh, right now, uh, probably be under me, the generation under me, the attention span when they, uh, when they, yeah, they watch videos, the algorithm is just like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. If it's beyond that, then they, they, yeah, they, just, they just swipe up or just swipe left on the next video. Box. So I think it is responsibility for us to, to play the brand uh, for us, uh, the the, uh, the new generation uh, in politics, though or or or, or not or non-partisan organizations, I think it's important for us to to play to always emphasize that intellectualism brand of politics is very important. As I mentioned earlier on just now, um, that the, the the leaders of our generation, personally, if I if I were to set a benchmark, they would need to know that they would at least need to know constitution. They need they would at least at least need to know the history of our of our nation. Those are the kind. Those are the kind of uh, the qualities of leaders, the leaders that uh, our generation should become when when we are leaders of the of the nation later on. So I think for us, we start small. We do our own TikTok videos. I've just learned TikTok a couple of months ago. It's a bit uh, it's a bit new to me, though. Uh, it's, yeah, it's yeah, it's a bit new to me. But I think it's a uh, it's a way for me to impart my knowledge, impart to my friends that what I do, what I what I my opinions. It's a new way which uh, we cannot discard. So probably that probably for us, for maybe maybe they want modern Malaysia Shrawaj can can also uh, impart knowledge, uh, uh, impart info infographics uh, as such in on social media, provided you have the right and correct information. Thanks again. That's true. And honestly, TikTok, 15 seconds, that's it. That's the, as much as the attention span people have nowadays. <laughs> so it's going to be quick and accessible in that sense. But agreed. All right. So that's for that question. We're going to move on with one final question before we go to the floor. And it's about this. This might cause a little bit of discussion, yes? <laughs> because when it comes to the 22nd of July, the question right now that I would like to pose to all of the speakers today is that should it be celebrated by those in Peninsula Malaysia and Sabah as well. Just like how you know we celebrate the 31st of August, Yanik Kenali Sebagai Hari Kemerdekaan for all, apparently. So what do you think? Would it, should it be celebrated by them? And would it actually strengthen national unity if they're on board? Maybe for this, um, is there anyone who would like to go first or okay, Miss Lina should put out her hand so you can go ahead. Malaya, Sabah and Sarawak are three nations in the Federation of Malaysia. And we all have our own independence dates. Okay. Sarawak celebrates 31st August arbitrarily from 1964. There was little thought into why it should be. Okay. So no, Malayans and Sabahans celebrating 22nd July with Sarawak will not foster and strengthen national unity. For them, it will be just another holiday of not going to work. Nation building, National unity, these are values that are nurtured in many other ways, not by you know sharing public holidays. Otherwise, the more public holidays a country has, no, the more united it will be. Okay. So this is my comment. All right, thank you, Ms. Lina Zhu. Um, next up, maybe Professor James. Yeah, I think at a practical level, uh, obviously it's not going to work, and it doesn't make a lot of sense as well. Uh, if you look at the other states, for example, uh, you know, half the states in, in Malaya, they actually do celebrate their own so-called state-level celebrations because they've got the birthday of their sultans and other important events, which is a public holiday in their, in their individual states. So it doesn't make sense for other states to, to celebrate uh, Sarawak Day or 22nd of July, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, I'm always more worried about, uh, you know, the, the, what do you call it, the meaning of, of, of this public holiday in Sarawak, the 22nd of July. And this is why I came back to this uh, idea that, you know, it's very important that uh, we nurture and try to understand further what is the Sarawak identity. And it seems to me that the 22nd of July is the most obvious date to try to understand the uh, identity of Sarawak or the unique yeah. identity of Sarawak. 
Thank you so much, Professor James. Azim, what do you think? Uh, for me, um, as I, I emphasize that how important it is for us, uh, especially our generation, to celebrate and commemorate 22nd July as a very significant uh, part of Sarawak's history. Uh, I think it's, as I say, it's not uh, it's not merely just a government function, but it should be celebrated by all Sarawakians, uh, regardless whether they are in Sarawak or they are uh, they are not in Sarawak, whether in West Malaysia, in Sabah, or in any other countries outside uh, outside of Malaysia. So I I do think that um, um, though if we want to mention that we want to stre strengthen national unity, for me. It is important, as, as I mentioned also earlier, it's it should be a celebration of the people, uh, regardless of uh, uh, regardless of where they are. They they, they should uh, celebrate and commemorate uh, the sacrifice of the leaders of the generations before us. So whether we want to compel um, um, non Sarawakians to celebrate, for me, uh, for me it's up it's up to it's up to them to to celebrate. Uh, even though I when I was abroad, I also joined. Uh, National Day celebrations by other countries. I think it's I, th I think it's a it's a very uh, lovely. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very uh, you know it's a it's a good celebration that even though it's not from my own country, but I we we join to uh, we we uh, I was encouraged to to join and understand their history. And it's also important for Sarawakians who are not in Sarawak, probably in West Malaysia, to celebrate uh, and commemorate Sarawak Day uh, or twenty second. Uh, 22nd July at their own ways. Lah. Some of them Otomoyong, some of them do watch along of, you know, uh, Rossi Dobi series or even, uh, you know, hanging, uh, putting up your, your the, the, the pride of our flags on our cars, on our motorcycles. It's more, for me, it's uh, not just a celebration, but it's more for us to impart and uh, impart knowledge of the importance of our own history to our uh, May probably West Malaysian friends who have never had knowledge on this, and and, and yes, it, it is it is important for uh, it is important for this date to be celebrated by Sarawakians regardless of where they are. But however, if we want to, I, and 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 it is uh, it is best for us to you know to encourage our non Sarawakian friends to uh, to cherish this day and also celebrate it along with us, so that uh, people understand the, the history. This the, the significant uh, history behind this twenty second date twenty second July. Thank you, Azim. So I guess uh, in a sense that overall it becomes a problem when this public holiday the twenty second of July is seen as just another public holiday. It needs to be celebrated in a sense with an understanding, or mm -hmm. use that twenty second of July as a means to start understanding in that sense. So that's quite interesting. Correct. So and, yeah, if I may add, what you guys are doing here is is correct. Is the correct way to celebrate. You know, you we, we discuss uh, about history. We discuss about uh, we we impart knowledge to people. So I think that's a good way for. And I commend again uh, DMM Sarawak for for having engagements like this. And actually, since we're on this particular question, before um, we really get into the floor, there's one question um, to add up to that because we're talking about national unity as well. So focusing on Sarawak and West Malaysia, we know that there are differences. We may not understand each other entirely sometimes. So what can be done to foster a stronger sense of national unity to reconcile that particular difference? So maybe this is something that the speakers can think about and suggest. Um, Professor James, do you have what's your view on this matter? Okay, um, the issue of uh, national unity in Malaysia is, is something that uh, that's very difficult. The reason is because, as I mentioned, uh, for the longest time, at least for the first 50 years after 1963, uh, the narrative about national unity, the narrative about what Malaysia is or was, was basically very Malaya-centric. Uh, so in a sense, uh, the sort of uh, national unity you're talking about is really top-down approach. Uh, what you find is that uh, that often uh, works for majority of population, but there will always be a minority who feel that they are being marginalized. I think uh, the issue of national unity in Malaysia is, is further complicated by what happened after 1969. Uh, but in the case of uh, Sabah and Sarawak, it's really been complicated uh, by the fact that the people of Sabah and Sarawak are really unhappy about what happened to MACC3. 
So I think uh, when you talk about uh, national unity in Malaysia, there are many, many layers that you're talking about. Um, I'm one of those people who strongly believe that, you know, you should really confront history. And in the case of uh, uh, Malaysian national unity, I think a good, a good place to start is actually to confront the historical grievances related to MA63, so that at least the people of uh, Sabah and Sarawak uh, don't feel so marginalized. Uh, but like I said, that is just one, one layer of it. There are many, many different uh, layers of, of national unity in Malaysia. So, but Malaysia is really a work in progress. At the end of the day, it is a very young country. Uh, but the two biggest items that we face in Malaysia uh, really is the toxic politics. And then all this is emanated, unfortunately, from the Malayan side. Uh, I don't, I mean, I can say openly here, uh, race and religion. I mean, this is really toxic politics. And that's the reason why I emphasize so much on the Sarawak identity. Uh, because if, if you really want trouble for Sarawak, you import those two items into Sarawak. And I guarantee you that there'll be trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor James. And honestly, that's true. It's a simple card to get people just angry, I suppose. So I, that's why it's, it keeps popping up. All right. So, oh, Azim, do you want to go next? Because I saw you uh, unmute. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Miss Lina or myself? Oh, uh, Miss Lina. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Or maybe, okay, since Miss Lina, maybe you can go ahead. And then Azim, you can end with you later. Okay. Okay, uh, I don't have anything nice to say about national unity. <laughs> okay, Malaysian society today is so fragmented, so polarized, so divisive that in my heart, you know, I think of it as a failed federation. So how the country will be uh, united I really don't know how. <laughs> That's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Lina. Actually, maybe, okay, Azim, before we go to you, because we use, what, yeah. how different was it back then? For me, maybe Miss Lina and Prof. Professor James, was it different back then? Was it better? Because I could have been, I'm not very sure. <laughs> Were people more united back then, in a sense, or? I, I think it's not a question of whether people were, were uh, more united back then. I think uh, in the old days, while uh, race and religion uh, were on the table, uh, people did not use them as as sharp political tools to further divide the population. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's the difference. And one of the fortunate things about Sarawak is that uh, although we have seen uh, uh, an, an uptake in race and religion, uh, basically, the the middle portion of Sarawak and the people at the top of Sarawak understand clearly, having seen what happened to uh, Malaya, uh, they understand clearly that uh, although everyone is proud of their race and people uh, take religion very seriously as a conservative Asian society, we should not use it as a political weapon, as a sharp political weapon to divide the people further. So I think the difference between back in the 50s and 60s and the situation now is that, you know, now, right, uh, politicians, if they want to become popular or they want to create noise for themselves, they, this is the sort of the weapons of choice. Uh, if people really want to know what it was like in the old days, I would suggest that they watch uh, some of the early P. Ramni movies. They sort of really represented Malayan societies, uh, what we might call live and let live society. You do your own thing, I do my own thing. Uh, but you know, I won't. I won't weaponize the issue of race. I won't weaponize the issue of religion, and I think that is a fear. I mean, what I'm saying is 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 nothing new. I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm referring to, and it's something that uh, that really uh, worries people like myself who who cares about what happens to Sarawak, what happens to Malaysia, what happens to the region. So I think it's it's very important that uh, that uh, you know that we Sarawak we have this political culture where we still believe that, you know, you can still live and let live. So I think it's very important that we maintain this political culture because I can tell you that I've been uh, uh, studying and researching and writing about Malaysian politics for more than 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> even longer than that. I can tell you that uh, that sort of attitude uh, do not exist in Malaya anymore. Thank you so much, Professor James. Ms. Nina, is there anything you'd like to add before we move on to Azim? Yeah, when, when I was in school, I live uh, through the uh, colonial, not uh, 
colonial era. But when I was in school, my two best friends were a Malay, Hairani, and an Indian, Ranji. We never thought of ourselves as Chinese, Malay, or Indian. We were just best friends, you know. And uh, like our professor says, those days are gone. It's just a fleeting moment, and uh, you know, it won't. Uh, I won't see those days again. It's so sad. Hmm. It becomes history now, isn't it? Yeah. Let's hope that maybe we can get better in the future. Maybe we can go to somewhere. <laughs> oh, all right. So that's thank you so much, Miss uh, Miss Nina and Prof James for giving us a little bit taste of what how it was in back then compared to now. So Azim, carry on with. So thank you, uh, uh, Dila and both esteemed panelists for giving us an enlightenment of how how, how it was before our generation came about. Uh, personally, for me, I have to admit that when I was young, I I felt that this uh, that uh, our community is I, I felt that this uh, this fragment the fragmentation of our community. Uh, I, I I feel that in at a young age, I know that um, um, what uh, what our forefathers wanted for us to to be united back then probably. Uh, it 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 it, uh, it did not did not happen entirely for our generation. I personally I worry how would it be when our my my of my children's generation later on would it be uh would the the fragment the, the fragmentation the fragmentation of our community be 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 much more you know multiplied further or would it be better so but what I think uh, what uh, uh, Professor James and uh, Ms. Lina mentioned it's mainly it's about who it, mainly who who sets the policy lah. So at the end of the day, it's the policy makers who makes who, who probably they have a good policy, but the way they do it is probably uh, give an effect to how they, how uh, and marginalize how uh, marginalize our community. So I think it's it's for us uh, younger generation, our young young leaders who. Who are uh, in politics, uh, although uh, although in non-partisan organizations, I do feel that um, it is important for us to to give the, when we uh, give the message. I always say it's about bangsa. It's, it's not about I always talk about bangsa, but it's about bangsa Sarawak. If I was talking about myself as a you know as a Sarawakian, uh, at the same time I'm also I have my own my own race, you know, my own ethnicity, being a Malay, but. I propagate that we are Sarawakian. So even though my own party is a traditionally is a race-based party, but as a whole, I believe that we move as a coalition, having uh, having my non non bumi friends along in, in in part of good policy. So I think it's a uh, responsibility for our generation whether we can. Uh, I wouldn't say solve this issue, but we can we mitigate this uh, and do better, do do good of national unity. Uh, for the generations to come, so I think uh, right now it's it's the message that we need to send uh, when we when we when we when we join when we join politics, Adila. So that's the good the good values of being uh, a united being being united regardless of our own ethnicity, but it's more of us being Bangsa Sarawak as a as a nation which we are proud of. Thank you so much, Azim, for sharing your insight on that as well. So basically, we've heard from all of our speakers. That's somewhat the end, almost the end for the moderated final questions. Um, it's already 9.10, so that's good. We're going to start taking in questions from the floor, but just to remind again to all of those who are watching on Zoom, um, if you would like to ask a question, you could either number one, raise your hand, and you can unmute yourselves when I prompt you to. Or if you're not if you're not comfortable with speaking, you can always put in your questions in the chat box, and we'll get that to that. And to those who are again watching on Facebook Live, don't worry, you can just leave your question in the comment section, and we will also bring it up here. All right, seems that we have one hand up. I hope the speakers are ready for the Q and A session. We have Shahira. I'm um, Shahira. Feel free to unmute yourself. And now, oh, hello, we can see you. It's wonderful. Go ahead. How are you guys? Thank you, uh, Miss Speaker. 
Uh, you know, sorry, Miss Moderator, and hello. Thank you to Nabrosa uh, Azim and uh, Professor James and Madam uh, Lina for the wonderful insight about it. My name is Shahira, and I have. I'm so excited to be part of this um, uh, discussion, actually. And I um, agree with a lot of the things that um, the speakers are saying. Um, just to share a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a Sarawakian from Kuching, proudly. And I think all Sarawakians would uh, share the same uh, patriotism, whether we're abroad or in KL or anywhere else. When we return to Sarawak, we, uh, we always identify as other Sarawakians. That's, that's the one I would agree. And, um, and I, I was living outside for quite some time. And when I return, uh, I share the same thing that I see where um, I'm shocked with the, um, how to say, the disunity uh, with our people. And number two, uh, that our young people are not that, uh, are politically illiterate. You know, we're in a position where uh, we have um, thank goodness uh, the education, but not many of our people, our young people especially, have that access to education. And in fact, one of the things that I wanted to initiate was an increase of political literacy or an awareness of political literacy uh, among our young people. I actually wanted to do that as a project when I came back here. Uh, and I would love to get in touch with you guys, that's number one, uh, about this uh, so that we can go forward. Um, but my question, I also uh, share um, the sentiments where um, I wanted to share my experience when I, uh, I got a job here and in a research um, institute. And one of the things they asked me, because my background is in political science and IR, one of the things they asked me was about federation, uh, the federal and the state relations. And this was the thing that I want to ask you guys about. Um, and my family are for working for the federal, but we're all Sarawakians. And there's this conspiracy when um, they say that um, the federal are neocolonizing Sarawak, okay? And uh, that the Sarawakian people are um, trying, part of our, half of us, Half of our population are propagating that Sarawakian for Sarawakian, Sarawak, sorry, Sarawak for Sarawakians, and the other half of us divided uh, population are uh, for a federal or, you know, for a, not to say federal, but more of a balance. They're too scared and they're trying to play it safe, as they say. So my question to all our three speakers is, um, is it because, um, What's the, what's the best way forward to harmonize our relation with the federal that doesn't jeopardize our interests? I would say interests, you know, uh, state interests. But at the same time, I um, uphold our identity and our stance in, um, you know, all of uh, our natural resources, protecting our natural resources and so forth. That's question number uh, one, yeah, please. Sorry, it was long. Would you like to direct it to, to all of the panelists or is there like a specific person you'd like to direct that to, Shahira? Yes, please. I'd like to hear uh, from all areas, the academic, the, uh, you know, uh, the GPL, the other opponents. It, it's great to hear from all sides. Too. Okay. So we'll give it to the entire panel. Is there anyone who'd like to go first? Ms. Lina, would you like to go first? Uh, can I be last this time? Okay, okay, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. so, what about Professor James? Would you like to go ahead and take these questions first? Uh, sure. Um, I just want to paraphrase the question because I, I, I part, part of the Zoom call was not very clear. Uh, she's, uh, she's asking how to get a more uh, balanced relationship between the federal and state government. Is that what she asked? Yes. Uh, okay, so basically, when, when you talk about the relationship between the federal and, and state government in the Malaysian context, uh, we follow a very strictly uh, the structure that we have 
and it's mostly governed within the Malaysian constitution, as you know, through a thing called the three lists. Uh, the first list is uh, exclusive federal powers. The second list is exclusive state powers. And the third list is concurrent, which is uh, some powers are shared between the federal government and the state government. Um, if, you want to, if you want to change the relationship uh, between the federal government and the state government, this is very much a political question and also a constitutional question. Uh, political question in the sense that you need agreement from both sides to change the structure of the federation. And it's a constitutional issue because if you really want to change uh, certain things, the way things are done, for example, transferring uh, powers from the federal list to the state list or the concurrent list, uh, you need to change uh, the constitution. So uh, it is not a, a, a simple issue of, uh, of, of the, it can, something that can be fixed immediately. So uh, the bigger problem I see within the Malaysian uh, Federation is that the original structure was never ahead to after 1981. You all know what happened in 1981. Uh, Malaysia's longest prime minister became prime minister in 1981. So his big thing was that he was a man in a hurry. He wanted to modernize Malaysia very, very quickly. Uh, he was not part of the old Malay political establishment. Uh, so basically, his idea was that in order to modernize Malaysia, uh, he wanted to centralize a lot of power. So Malaysia became more or less uh, not a true federal state after 1981. Uh, the federal government became uh, too powerful. So that's the reason why you hear complaints about the federal government doing things without uh, consultation. Uh, so if you want to sort of uh, uh, make the, the, the system work better for the individual states, you really need to balance out the powers of the federal government and balance out the powers of the, of, of the states as well. The problem within the Sarawak context and within the Sabah Sarawak context is that we have a list of additional items that we want autonomy or what in the 63, 62-63 era, we call them safeguards. We want additional safeguards for Sabah and Sarawak. And that is part of this thing called the Malaysia Agreement 63. So it's a question of that, how do you uh, build these safeguards within these three lists, uh, the state list, federal list, and concurrent list? Or do you want something completely different? You want a federal state system where the states are almost as powerful as the federal government and that the federal government always only looks after what we might call national core issues, things like defense, foreign policy, and almost everything else you push to the states. Uh, so there are various models around the world, but basically the Malaysian model, on the surface, it looks like a federation, but uh, my opinion is that in reality, it's very much a centralized federation. The federal government is too powerful. And that if you want a more balanced approach, you really have to go back and look at how the thing is structured and look at uh, whether you want to devolve power further or you want to come up with a new uh, list or even add on an additional fourth schedule, which is uh, you know, special powers devolved to Sabah and Sarawak. Now, in terms of the issue of civil service, uh, that is a very, very difficult uh, 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 issue to, to deal with in the Malaysia context. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, Malaysia, unlike uh, other countries in the region, right? It, um, our civil service is, uh, how should I put it? Not a normal civil service. <laughs> Because in, in the Malaysian system, right, uh, all sorts of people are counted as part of the civil service, uh, the health system, the education. All that. In, in other countries, uh, not all, but in most countries, right, these are their own, uh, what do you call it, their own commissions. So if, you, if you're a teacher in some countries, right, you're actually not counted as part of the civil service. But in Malaysia, you know, if you're, if you're a university lecturer, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, everybody's a civil service. So that's why our civil service is so large in Malaysia because it, it, even a, a, you know, a person serving in the armed forces is counted as a member of the civil service. So uh, in terms of the civil service, the issue is not the, the number of Sabahans or Sarawakians in the civil service. The question is at the very top, the leadership of the civil service uh, that uh, people from Sabah and Sarawak are wholly underrepresented. So this is where I came back to the earlier point that you know when they do things, they don't take into account the views of uh, Sabah and Sarawak. So that is where the problem lies. And that solution, uh, the, he, this is the good news. That, that solution is an is a easily resolved political problem. 
because uh, the chief secretary to the government or what they call formally titled as secretary to the federal cabinet, he takes his orders from the prime minister. So if the prime minister tomorrow, I mean, hypothetically, says that I want to increase the number of, you know, USA, the, the top civil service, say from 3% uh, from Sabah Sarah up to 15% within, you know, within a lifespan of a parliament five years, right? And uh, that can be done easily. So uh, I think when you talk about the civil service within that specific context, you need to understand the issue is not the number. It is the level, uh, uh, you know, at the very top where Sabahans and Sarakans are not represented and therefore your voices are not heard. Uh, I think uh, Azim will, will follow up. He's the, probably the next best person to, to follow up on this question. Thank you. I continue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor James. Um, Shaira, your regards, your three questions which you have shared, I think I can answer one and two. And your question number three in regards to the conspiracy, I, I'd be happy if, uh, I personally, I'm not privy to this uh, document or this idea. If I, I'd be happy if you can share it uh, with me uh, separately later on. Uh, on but uh, for question one and two, I think it's very important is because uh, your concern is actually my concern because we we are of the same generation and what you feel is what I also feel so that's why I, I decided to to be part of the political system at uh, at this age and it, I, I I do know that uh, I do feel that when people say that we are politically uh, illiterate uh, Personally, for me, it's if we want to fix it, it's not just politically well, young youngsters, young people should be polit politically literate, but they should also be also they should also be constitutionally literate. We need to know how the uh, you know what is the federation, what what it, how how does Dunsha what works, how does uh, uh, constitution federal works. I think that's very basic, which I uh, I emphasized from earlier on that uh, our generation we should play. Uh, we should play the brand of politics which we propagate intellectualism. Correct? If we can, we can do football programs at Kampong, but at the same time, we need to share the message. Or oh, 22nd July is this, is this, and, and 16th September is this, is this. I think those are, those are the things which um, young politicians, we, we need to practice uh, regardless of which party maybe we later join or myself. That, 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 that is how I do it in my own system. I need to, I, when when I uh, how I uh, join how I join them when when I yeah sama main main ball main cepat takraw with this with with them but at the same time uh, what is important is that you impart the message that uh, politics uh, uh, knowledge uh, about politics and basic knowledge about constitution is very important like uh, like I I always call it is it's basically general knowledge even though you can't find it maybe if you can't find it in our education system which uh, if, if, if I were to complain about our education system, we won't we won't take tonight lah. But it it takes us, you know, the, our youngsters who are who are privileged, you know, who who who, who might, like myself, we we happen to have the privilege to go to school, to go to university. It's our responsibility to impart and to educate uh, our youngsters uh, beyond our own circle. And personally, for me, uh, personally for me, I think um um. Uh, doing things uh, online virtually like this is good, but if we have access to if we have access to communities uh, beyond the cities, uh, beyond uh, people who can reach information online, we need to go down and turun padang and you know educate them, tell them that, that uh, spread them this message that being politically aware and uh, constitutionally learned is very important. Uh, so that's my message for uh, your question, Jaya. Thanks. I agree with that. Actually, uh, on the ground should be the way to go. Um, and it's not just um, political literacy, but also voting education. But we don't even have a simple, basic understanding of the constitution of the government structure. So how we do, are we expecting our youth to vote properly without them understanding the basic structures or the basic... Uh, concepts. Yeah. I, I, think Shahira, um, I, I feel you, but if you were to change the leaders right now, it, it, it may take a while, but what we can do is make sure that the youngsters who join politics are the right people who, who are being put center. So they need to bring this agenda to educate. 
and to impart knowledge. Uh, yeah, and, it, and it takes not just political parties, but uh, organizations like DMM uh, Sarawak uh, to, to, do, to take part and do and also uh, spread awareness and educate our own youngsters. Uh, we, we have to do it our own selves. It's no shortcut to it. Correct. Very interested on that. I actually uh, dropped my, my contacts. You all are in Kuching, right? So except for Prof. James Chin, it's a shame because we would like to kidnap you as well <laughs> to be part of this. <laughs> so thank you. And I think I want to hear from uh, Miss Lina Sue as well for, on these questions. Please, thank, thank you, Shahira. Okay. The best advice I can give you, you must have four constitutional documents. The first one is the intergovernmental report. The intergovernmental report gives the safeguards and the assurances and forms a basis for the Malaysia agreement. Okay. So the Malaysia agreement 10760 is registered in the United Nations. Okay. So this is a mother of all documents because without the Malaysia agreement, there is no Malaysia. The third constitutional book you must have is the Constitution of Sarawak and lastly, the Federal Constitution. So have these four books on hand, read them up and you'll be very knowledgeable. So everything, everything, is in these four books, okay? In these four books. So every question can be answered. Federal state relations, bonernization, uh, economic resources and all this, everything is in there, okay? So for Sarawak, we are very lucky. For Sarawak and, bon and Sabah, we are very lucky. We have a lot of protections and provisions under the Malaysia Agreement and IGC report, okay, which the other states of Malaya do not have. Okay, so all our rights are in there, all our powers in there. Okay, and then Article Eight, Article Eight of the Malaysia Agreement. I'll read it to you. The governments of the Federation of Malaya, North Borneo, and Sarawak will take such legislative, executive, or other action as may be required to implement the assurances undertakings and recommendations contained in chapter three of and annexes A and B to the report of the Intergovernmental Committee signed on the 27th February 1963, in so far as it's not implemented by express provision of the Constitution of Malaysia. So whichever is not uh, implemented, okay, the governments, our government can take any legislative and executive action to get it done. Okay, so, Nothing is beyond hope. So any questions you know, about the state of affairs in Sarawak, all the answers are in here. Okay. And the other thing is uh, our level of political maturity is very low in Sarawak. It's because most of our people do not understand politics and government. Politics and government is not in our curriculum. So therefore, our youngsters, they have very low understanding, you know, how we form government, you know, and what does politics do. So the education department has you know, to adjust its curriculum so that our uh, students can turn out to be more knowledgeable, more politically uh, conscious, and more politically matured. So this is a failing of our governments, which I hope you know it can be uh, done, can be uh, redressed. That's all I can say now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Lina, for sharing your view, Shahira. Hope you're okay with the answers that were provided by all our speakers tonight. All cool? All great. Hope to see whatever you have in plan. Seems like you do have something hooking up. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh. <laughs> all right, so we'll move on to the next question because we do have another question. Uh, the next question is from Alphonsus. So I'll just read out what he 
what they what they typed out. So it goes like this: on the question of whether Sarawak achieved, oh, welcome back, Azim. On whether on the question of whether Sarawak achieved independence or self government, do we know between twenty second July and sixteen September whether the British flag was still flying on Sarawak soil, and who the head of state of Sarawak was? Between twenty second July and sixteen September, was the head of state of Sarawak still the British Governor Alexander Waddle? That's the question that's been posed. I can answer that question. Oh, sorry. You can't have us. If the experts to answer, sila. Is it up to James if you do have an answer? Because I I don't. Oh no, it's alright. I'll let Lina answer. Answer. All right. Okay. Back again to this UN document, you know, on the factors indicative of the attainment of independence. Okay. There are actually two levels of independence. One, I think you can call it tier two, is self governance, okay, without sovereignty. Then the, the full level will be full national independence of uh, international status, you know, where the state is sovereign. Okay. So between 20, on the 22nd July, okay, Sarawak was granted our own local government. We have a chief minister, we have a cabinet. Okay? So this is a government. We have a territory. Okay? We have a government. Okay? We have a population. So we are independent. Okay? At that point, okay, the, our government could change the, Brit, the governor, the governor was British at that time, okay? But we are independent, okay? We are living British rule, okay? So our cabinet can appoint a new government in place of the British governor, who was Sir Alexander Waddell. But he was, you know, he stayed on until the 15th of September, okay? So, I think the problem is English is an ambiguous language, okay? So by this document, self-governance is also independence. But I can see that we are so used to thinking that it's either independence or it's self-government. Self -government. And self-government is not independence. So I like to correct this, okay? We actually have two tiers of independence, and the second tier is self-government. So the British flag was still flying on Sarawak soil from the 22nd July to the 16th September because Britain still held Sarawak sovereignty okay? to the international world. Sarawak is still a British colony. Like I have said earlier on, you can call yourself independent, but the crux is the real criteria is do other countries recognize you? So at that point in time, we have independence, but no other country recognize us as independent. They only see us as a British colony, okay? So we continue to let the governor be the uh, be British, and we still allow British to hold our sovereignty <coughs> until 16 September, when our sovereignty was handed over to the Federation of Malaya, renamed Malaysia. Okay. So the fact that our governor was still British, he still Alexander Water, the British flag is there. Okay, doesn't mean that we are not independent. If we could, you know, on the 22nd of July, we could just take down the British flag. We could just, you know, change our governor to a local Sarawakian. That is possible. But we did not do that. Okay. So let me uh, repeat. Okay, self-governance is 
also independence. It's only how far the level, you know, the government wants to carry it through. Whether you want to be fully nationally independent and sovereign, okay? In which case, you need to go to the next level, go and seek political recognition, you know, get uh, other nations to uh, recognize you, okay? then you will be uh, independent of international status. So the English language is, is not perfect. It's not, it's not perfect, you know. Independence means many things. It can mean national independence. It can mean self-governance, you know. That's it. So that is what I think is confusing to, uh, you know, a lot of people. Am I, am I clear? <laughs> One moderator. I'm okay, I'm clear. <laughs> I was wondering if maybe if Alphonsus, if you have like a follow up question, you can go ahead and just ask a follow up question as well. Um, feel free to unmute if you want, or if you feel if you're typing it, you can type it in first. Because yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Miss Nina, for 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 guiding us through that again. Um, is there anything that me um Azim and Prof James would like to add on, or we can go on with Said Musa's question also because we have another one. I think go to the next question, please. Okay, let's go to the next question. And there are two more after that. So we'll do this real quick. We do, Syed Musa asked this, plenty of groups are pushing for Sarawak to leave Malaysia, despite MA63 already being reinstated into the federal constitution. So is there still any relevance for us to leave, leave Malaysia? So any other panelists would like to go ahead and take this up first? Uh, why don't you read the other question as well? Uh, so that, you know, It'll be okay. faster. Yeah. Okay, right. Cool, cool. So the second one, maybe we'll take two questions at once. Good. So the second question is from Peter Kailang. He said that Sarawak doesn't have a state religion. And this is one of the most important preconditions stated by our Sarawak leaders in those days. However, I don't see any difference between Sarawak today in comparison to some other states in Malaysia which have state religion. So this is up for comment for the rest of the day. Okay. Right, so maybe we'll take these two questions first. Um, Prof. James, you can go ahead first, and then we go to Azim and go to Miss Lina after that. Okay, so I think the question of succession is always being on the table, especially since uh, 2008 onwards. I think the question of uh, succession is, is a very uh, loaded question. Uh, the reason is because I think a lot of people who push for the succession uh, argument have not uh, thought through uh, all the issues carefully. I think the underlying assumption is that Surau is a large state. We have uh, quite a young population. We've got plenty of natural resources and therefore uh, uh, you know, uh, getting out of the Federation shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the other thing that's widely spread in social media, of course, is that uh, people like to use two examples. One is that Singapore got out in 65 and therefore there's no reason why Sarawak can't get out and that Singapore is now very successful. And of course, in terms of Singapore success, people always look at the exchange rate between the Sing dollar and the Malaysian ringgit, which currently stands at uh, 3.1, just a short reminder. <laughs> the other one that people always like to use is the, uh, the Brunei uh, uh, Sultanate, where at the very last minute, they pull out uh, you know, of, the, of the MCC process and decided not to uh, go ahead uh, despite uh, the push by the British. Okay, the reality is this. Uh, this is my personal opinion. I'm not taking, uh, I just want to make it clear that it's, um, it's not a question of me taking sides of who's right, who's wrong, or taking a political position. Uh, my position uh, uh, is, or my opinion is, is simply this. Uh, succession in Southeast Asia based on recent uh, uh, experience in this region is fraught with danger. Uh, in the Malaysian case, uh, I can tell you straight away that the Malay political establishment in Peninsula Malaysia or Malaya will not allow Sarawak to break away without a fight. A large part of the Malay establishment in Malaya think that it was a mistake that Tunku made to allow uh, Singapore to leave Malaysia 65 and they will not allow a similar situation. So uh, related to that is, you know, if 
uh, people of Sarawak, if for whatever reasons, if they think that there's enough political capital to pull Sarawak uh, out of the Federation of Malaysia, then the question I will ask is who's going to pay the blood price? When I said the blood price, basically, I mean the West, uh, the federal government is going to impose emergency rule. They're going to arrest. And if, if there needs to be, they're going to shoot a lot of people. Uh, this is the reality of the Malaysian situation. Uh, it is very clear that they are not not uh, not interested in this issue of, of, of succession because uh, they are worried that if Sarawak goes, then obviously the, the next candidate will be Sabah because there's really nothing to hold back uh, Sabah. In some ways, Sabah is even a, a better candidate to break away uh, because uh, I don't want to be rude to my Sabah Hans friends, but let's just say that more than one third of the population are not real Sabahans. <laughs> so, so if you want to talk about pulling people away, I think they, they are in some ways, demographically speaking at least, much better to prepare to live under a new regime. Uh, so that, that is basically basically my point. There's the related to that, you know, if, if you got a blood price, but on top of that is something that uh, Lena has alluded to earlier, which is if you want to break away, that is fine. The question is that who's going to recognize you? And in this case, right, in the 21st century, if you want to break away, you want to be fully independent, uh, for lack of a better word, you need a sponsor from a really major power so that you will be able to stand on your own two feet, at least for the initial period. So again, I like to stress that I'm not taking a position either way. I'm just explaining to you I know, the, some of the questions that is not being asked, at least not in public. In public, it's all about, you know, that, you know, the Malaysian Federation has failed, it has not delivered, MSCC3 has not, uh, what do you call, has not delivered to Sarawak all the promises made back in 62, 63. Uh, the Federation is broken now. We do not want to be part of this Federation. I understand all that narrative, but I'm saying that, you know, you need to go on and ask a very serious set of related questions uh, before you can make an informed choice. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. James. Azim, would you like to continue on from that? Yes, uh, well deliberated by two esteemed panelists. I, I take the question from uh, one of us, like Musa, in regards to um, um, Sarawak being reinstated back into, I'm sorry, MA63 being uh, reinstated back into the federal constitution. Uh, just to correct you, it's technically it's not reinstated because it, it was technically it was never even, even in the federal constitution before. Before this, before the amendment recently, the only MA uh, MA fifty seven nineteen fifty seven was Malay Agreement was the one uh, was the one uh, being referred to uh, in the federal constitution. Uh, personally, I do uh, uh, I do think that uh, I mean the opinion of that uh, the leadership that we have right now, uh, mm. though, though they have their flaws, but I think they are they have the political appetite to bring back what. Uh, what 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 is what should belong to us, and I think that has been uh, that has been constrained by the support of the people uh, for the party in the recent election. Uh, most um, majority of Sarawakians choose. Uh, I have to mention my political party GBS to uh, to to lead the countries because uh, majority of Malaysians believe that we we are the, the value that uh, GBS leaders. Believe that we uh, we are always part of Malaysia. We will always be part of Malaysia. That is the value that most majority of Sarawak kids share. So that's my comment, Dila. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azim. We can Miss Lina soon. We can provide your view, and then we'll move on to Peter Kailang's question after that about state religion. Okay. Uh, Singapore already set the precedent. Okay. Uh, it's exited peacefully, or it was thrown out. You know whatever, but it is uh, possible for a state to leave the Federation. Okay. We know that there was independent struggle before. In fact, Salkins are very patriotic and very nationalistic, okay? It's nothing new. Uh, in 1946, Okay, we had a big you know, independence uh, struggle going on when Sarawak was going to be annexed by uh, England. Okay? So 
they were the first nationalists, you know, the Malay, the Melanau, you know, and uh, you know the other communities as well. They're the first nationalists. And in 1963, in 1962, actually, there was an uprising which happened in Brunei, Sabah, and Sarawak. Sarawak happened in Bekenu and Limbang. You know? uh, so it is throughout the years, it has been the aspiration of Sarawakians to rule our own state. Okay? This feeling, this sentiment, you know, is not new at all. So of course today, there are still sectors of our population who aspire for a free and independent Sarawak. Okay? But the struggle for Sarawak independence must be constitutional. Okay? It must follow the law. Okay? It must be peaceful. It's possible to have you know, peaceful revolutions you know, at this age in time. It must be internationally recognized. There's no point to uh, declare independence if no country recognizes you. And like uh, Professor says, you need a superpower behind, you know? And it must have the consent of the people. Okay. So this is the only way that a nation aspiring for independent sovereign status must go through, okay? Peacefully and with the will of the people. So in fact, we have already declared, you know, strong independence day, but we have not uh, achieved international status because there's still another process to be followed, okay? So this process is not out of reach, okay? The process that uh, we need to do is to get support from other nations, okay? And then to show the will of the people. And that can be only done through a referendum, okay? To prove that the people vote for it. Okay? Only a referendum can legitimize an aspiration for independence. Okay? So that is the next stage. If the people of Sarawak want to proceed beyond, you know, self-government. And it's not impossible. Because <laughs> it's been seen and done. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Nina, for your, for your opinion on that. I'm just doing a time check. It's already 9.50. I think we can cover up two more questions, going back to the state religion and Joshua Nimba. And then I still have one more question just to end everything, and then we can call it a night. So we'll go with Peter Kailang's question again first about Sarawak not having a state religion um, but then right now he sees that he doesn't see any difference between Sarawak today in comparison to some other states in Malaysia, which does. So he would like the panelists to comment on this. Um, maybe you can keep it short and sweet so that we can make time for Joshua Nimbar Tan's question as well. So Prof. James, do you want to go ahead first? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not sure what is there to comment here. He's just merely stating a legal fact that the Sarawak state constitution does not mention uh, uh, that there was a, a official religion or state religion. Uh, I'm not really sure uh, there's anything else to, to, to comment. Okay, no worries. Okay, maybe Azim or Ms. Lina, is there anything you would like to add on? Uh, me too, uh, me too, Adele. Um, technically, it's, uh, it's constitutionally connected. Uh, uh, oh, he's, he's, right. Yeah, he's, he said he can elaborate. Um, Mr. Peter, I, would you like to maybe unmute yourself to elaborate a little bit to um, explain what you mean by with, with your question? Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Yeah, what I see is that uh, if you say that Sarawak does not have a state religion, but you look at the, what we have, we have the Sri Akkot as well. We have Baitumal as well. If you come to Miri where I live, the building where the uh, government department is uh, renting is belong belong to Baitumal, and you have the uh, what you call all the requirement uh, all that you see in the other states which have state religion. You can see it here. I don't see anything different. You have the you know I I don't want to count in it, but on top of that, 
because I am dealing with uh, land right issues and all that. Some of the provisionalists, you know, uh, that is uh, for logging and plantation and all, is given to Tabung Haji and all that. So how is it? I, I don't understand how is that uh, different. If you go to the hotel in Miri, in Kuching, in Cebu, all these hotels that are star hotel, they don't, in the old days when I was young, you can find Chinese food as well. You can go for the Muslim food if you want. The same thing, you know, if you go to the clubs, you know, some of these public clubs, we used to have two kitchen, one Muslim kitchen and one uh, non-Muslim. But now it's all, you know, when you put all the, everybody seems to be of one religion. So if you don't have a star religion, why do you prioritize one particular religion? We have uh, Islamic school as well, which is exclusively for the Muslim and the syllabus in school as well. Uh, how is it different? Thank you. Thank you so much for the clarification. I think it makes it much clearer as well now. It's basically saying, well, on paper, is there's no state religion, but practical wise, it seems though that there is. So the speakers, do you have anything? What would you comment on that? Okay. Uh... Sawat is the only state in the federation which does not have a state religion. Okay. In fact, state is, I mean, religion is a state issue. Okay. It actually has nothing to do with federal. Okay. My belief is the government should not be involved in religion because religion is between me and God and nobody else. So I do not agree when we have a department called Unifor for other religions. So why is there other religions? Which means that there is one supreme religion above the other religions. Okay, so that is my beef. Okay. The other thing is, which I'm not able to discuss at this stage. There was one uh, article, one says one D on religion. So that part was deleted. Uh, it was repealed. That part of the law was repealed, repealed. And it did affect you know, the status of uh, Islam in Sarawak. In the sense that now our governor is the head of religion of Islam. Okay. But I will not go into the details of 161D. That is something, you know, that was uh, not correctly done, you know. And to really bring back Sarawak as a circular state, one this one, this should be brought back into our constitution. So that's it for me, on religion. Thank you so much, Ms. Lina. Is there anything that Prof. James or Azim would like to add on to that? No. Okay. I think we should try to answer as many questions as possible. All right, so we'll go on with the next question. Joshua Nimbatan's question, which reads like this. Why was Sarawak given that short period of de facto independence by the British before joining Malaya, Singapore, and North Borneo to form Malaysia? If it was just to expose Sarawakians to self-governance, couldn't they have done so in a Hong Kong-style handover to cleanly and directly admit Sarawak into Malaysia on the 16th of September? That's a question for that. If any of the panelists would like to take it, you can go ahead. Any other questions? Maybe we try to answer two at the same time. Yeah. Um, there's another one. It's not really a question. It's more of, uh, I'll just read it to you, to the panelists. It's by honor. And they're asking to correct them if they're wrong or not. Or I guess it's about their understanding where federal slash Malaya wouldn't or never give so easy to Sarawak and North Borneo more power than the federal. As in, Honor believes that to rule one nation, the ruler must control the power and money. And of course, this is related to politics. And politicians from Sarawak and North Borneo shall be set, shall to shall set their political goal for these struggles. So that's the two things that we will be covering so far. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first question I'll answer uh, very straight in thirty seconds. <laughs> Uh, the reason why there was never a period of so-called training for self-government, whatever you want to call it, is because uh, even from uh, immediately after the war, there was already discussion about what to do with all the British held territories around the world. 
So even in the early days, there was already a uh, 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 planning uh, in Whitehall in London that eventually uh, Britain will have to give up uh, most of its territories in Southeast Asia. So the planning was always that uh, they will try to leave the region peacefully, but what they did not accounted for was the fast rise of, uh, in those days, it was what they called the red menace or the yellow menace. They were very worried about the rise of communism in Southeast Asia, because you have to remember at that time, uh, China fell 49, and after that, uh, you got Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, all those became flashpoints. So there was an urgent move to, to, to deal with the colonies very quickly. And uh, they were really informed from the security angle that uh, the best thing to do was to lump all their colonies or the territories they control together into a single political entity. So that's the reason why they pushed very hard uh, for uh, Brunei, Singapore, North Borneo, Sarawak and Malaya uh, to, to, to come together. So the planning from the, from the British side was actually uh, done a long time ago. And what I'm trying to say here is that it was a lot of that was informed by international politics, especially uh, the Cold War era. So it's very difficult to uh, say, you know, the question asked was that, why didn't they uh, do the Hong Kong thing? Because we're living in a different era, the people planning it had different things on their mind in terms of the calculation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. James. So if there's anything, I think Azim is in uh, there. Okay. Uh, question, uh, question uh, posted by Honor. I think, um, uh, well, well um, so reading, back, reading back history and of what uh, Lina shared about uh, 1962 in Bakenu, Limbang, uh, blood, there was bloodshed of our own Sarawakian people. And I think that uh, um, if there were there were movement to if there were movement to to go to go to the extent of uh, to go to the extent of you know uh, of the idea of separation uh, i think uh, in regards to now uh, based on uh, real data that uh, we it, it, election results uh, we we see that majority of uh, majority of Sarawakians, uh, they choose to be in a government which uh, part of uh, which supports the idea of being uh, a nation with Indonesia. Thank you, Adina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I, I have to stop in here. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have to say, uh, again, this is my personal opinion, but uh, uh, elections in Sarawak, uh, people vote for all sorts of reasons, and most of them are illogical. <laughs> And also the unique thing about uh, voting in Sarawak, especially outside the uh, uh, urban centers, right? Uh, Azim, you may not agree with me, but uh, the number one driving factor is money politics. So I won't read too much results or try to expect or like, uh, try to interpret too much into election results in Sarawak. <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that there are other factors at, at play as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. James. I mean, I mean, again, uh, as Azim said earlier, it's okay to disagree and have different opinions. It can be done in a simple manner. And okay, actually, that will be all of the questions so far. Maybe because it's already 9.59, it's close to 10. We, to end this entire session, I'll leave you all, panelists, one final question, just so that we can end it nicely. You can sum it up in 30 seconds, if possible, um, which is this. So what are your hopes and dreams for Sarawak in the future? So maybe we can start with Ms. Lina Su first. Well, I believe in the democratic fundamentals where the government is of the people, by the people, for the people. As a Australian, I believe in the basic human right of self-determination, where the people of Sarawak can freely choose our own political, social, and economic future to chart our own destiny. Stockings are ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lina Su, for that. Right, Professor James, you're next. Oh, it's very simple. I, I think it's, it's uh, that we really need to uh, have more of the Surround narratives. I think Surround's history, uh, not only in, 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 uh, in the Federation of Malaysia, but in the region, is actually quite unique. Uh, the perfect example of that is that Surround is the only territory in Southeast Asia that was ruled by a private British uh, uh, family or that sort of thing. So I think that there is something unique about Sarawak. I think it's worth creating the Sarawak narrative. I think it's worth having a, a Sarawak political culture. 
Uh, but I think the most important thing is really awareness. So I'm very, very happy that uh, uh, Dewa Muda has uh, organized a webinar such as this. It's really all about the younger Sorakians uh, learning more about their own history and learning uh, you know, not only their own personal history, but the unique Sarawak identity. And that is out there. It's a question for younger Sorakians to learn more about it and perhaps to document it a bit more so that we don't lose this. It's very easy to lose your identity, but it's very difficult to regain it. Thank you. That's true, Prof. James. And speaking of the youth and younger Sarawak, Azim. Thank you, Adila. Uh, thank you, esteemed panelists. Uh, perhaps the first question, the, the big question today, uh, and in regards to the uh, 22nd of July, uh, the important thing uh, that I would like to impart, uh, especially to listeners who are my friends, uh, friends of uh, friends of, of, of this generation, the the thing about celebrating, what is important about celebrating this date is actually we celebrate the sacrifice and appreciate what our forefathers have fought for. Uh, there were instances where um, there were, uh, you know, in 19, uh, 19, uh, 1946, where 338 uh, government servants who, who were fighting for independence since then, even before, before 1907, 1963, uh, the, the fight has been, has always been going on. And we, we commemorate our forefathers for, for their effort, for the privilege that we have today. And the privilege, the freedom, the democratic rights that we have today shall not be taken for granted. So what we do is, uh, is what, we, what we need to do is number one, we, the youth, we need to equip ourselves with uh, knowledge. Uh, be, it is important to not, be, not only be politically aware, but politically literate and also constitutionally knowledgeable. It's, it's especially if, if, you can't, if you can't do the whole, the whole uh, the whole constitution. You need at least, at least to know the basics. Uh, as as that that is your responsibility as as a as a as a, as a Sarawakian. And, uh, and lastly, uh, my uh, youth friends uh, do show up in uh, in elections. Uh, do vote responsibly. Choose your leader correctly. Choose the lead. Choose the leaders. Uh, I, I, I emphasize choose the leaders correctly. Not just because of the party, but those leaders who represent you in the assembly that is um, what you, you need to understand the agenda what are the things that they want to bring for for their constituency and the uh, and, and Sarawak as a whole and lastly i'd like to commend uh, for the third time i commend Dewan Muda Malaysia as a uh, uh, friends of my own generation who have this intellectual discourses like this i hope this is not the the i hope you can do more discourses like this which uh, myself will support. I I, I guarantee uh, Miss Lina and Professor James to support these kind of initiatives and um, do do much more uh, engagements like this with uh, learned figures for uh, the development of Sarawak. Thank you, Lila. Right. Thank you so much, Azim. And I will agree to that. Maybe this could be the beginning of a few other initiatives and with people like experts like from James and Miss Lina Su and also members of the public to come along with support. Maybe we could reach. Somewhere better for Sarawa as well. And with that, we have ended the questions for today, for today's session. Major thank you to all of the speakers for their insights and also the participants for being really engaging and giving us a bit more, more, more a few more questions to get the discussion really rolling. And hopefully we leave today's session with a better understanding on Sarawa Day and actually Sarawa in general. But before everyone goes goes off. Please stay on a little bit, especially those on Zoom. Maybe what we can do is for everyone to turn on your cameras if you're a little, if you're okay with that, and we can take a group picture together if that's all right. So, and we will get the secretariat to help me take a picture of that. So we'll wait just for a bit, maybe one minute for anyone who's comfortable enough to open your cameras. Go ahead, find your your lighting. I know it's night, but it's okay. We'll make do. <laughs> Okie dokes. And then maybe the person, the secretariat, if you are ready to take the picture, you let me know and I'll just count to three. Okay. Is everyone in there already? See everyone? Okay. All right. So it's already 10 6. Everybody get ready. Just smile because we don't know which page you're on. So we'll just um, keep smiling until we're done. Okay. All right. <laughs> so ready. Okay, ready? Five. One, two, three.
again. <laughs> um, I think I see a few people turning on their cameras. Can go ahead. Yeah, I think a lot of people hasn't turned yeah. on their cameras yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can we give them a bit more time? Let's turn on your cameras a little yeah. bit. Okay, I can see people now. Hello, everybody. Great. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Okay. I'll count to three. Everyone ready? One, two, three. Okie dokes. Is there a second page? Do we need to go to the second page? Um, no, this is the first page. Okay. Should we go to the second page? Um, I do. Okay. All right, then. All right. Right, so I'll just count to three again. One, two, three. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and staying with us for two hours. I hope that you get um get a lot of insight from today's um today's today's session. And I hope that you will continue supporting the AM Sarawak and all of their initiatives. And happy advanced Sarawak Day. <laughs>